Hey everybody. Let's get this started. All right, welcome everyone to our first uh, beers with the brewer. Uh, I'll see if this is pop popular enough that we keep them going. And full disclosure, I stole this idea from another brewery, but I like the idea. I don't get that opportunity that often to talk face to face with with our patrons. So I figure this is a nice, uh, safe, socially distant way to do that and gives me a chance to hear questions and feedback from all of you and um, yeah, maybe get some beer ideas from you. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to uh, talk about the beer, which I love to talk and make and drink beer. So uh, a little bit about myself, since uh, for many of you, this will be the, the first time I'm talking to you. Uh, and then I'll cover a little bit of the how Twinspan got started, and then we'll dig into the beers, uh, the beers that I have in front of me. Hi. So, um, yeah, at any point, if you have questions or comments, uh, feel free to send them my way. Uh, we'll keep this pretty casual. Um, yeah, so I'm the head brewer, one of the founders and owners of Twinspan Brewing in Bettendorf, Iowa. I'm Adam Ross. Um, I have been home brewing for uh, almost 15 years uh, before I started at, uh, started Twinspan. And in those 15 years, uh, I've been brewing an awful lot. Um, I, I don't know if, I don't believe I've ever missed a month. There was a month where I didn't brew. And there was a period there where I was brewing at least once per week, which is crazy. Um, but it really helped me hone in uh, my skills. And I learned an awful lot about what I like and don't like about specific beers and the styles. Um, and I love to read about beers. That's pretty much all beer books up there. And I've read, I think, most all of them, actually. Um, I, I have very few props up there. I think they're they're all legitimate books. Um, yeah, so homebrewing for 15 years. Then, uh, well, uh, after a few years of homebrewing, I got involved with the Mugs Homebrew Club out of uh, the Quad Cities. It's one of the oldest brewing clubs out there, I believe. Um, really learned what other people, what beer is capable of being and what my beer is capable of being. I've learned so much through that. Uh, and then after doing that for a while, I, I thought, what's the next step? I mean, I think every home brewer wants to open a brewery at some point, just like I'm pretty sure every person who picks up a guitar has dreams of joining a, a band or a rock band at some point. Um, and that was true of me, but Realistically, the way my life was going, uh, I didn't think that was really going to happen. And But I still wanted to continue my knowledge and my skills with it. So I started studying for the Cicerone program. It's like the uh, sommelier in wine, in whiskey. There's also, uh, in the beer world, it's called the Cicerone program. And <clears throat> I um, was studying that. That took me well over a year of studying. I uh, started talking to some people, and they said that they um, are thinking about starting a brewery, and would I be interested? And it, it, the way it played out, I, I couldn't pass it up. This was the opportunity uh, that I, I wanted, and uh, I took it. So did planning on that, uh, worked with uh, this uh, buddy of mine, and uh, he brought in another guy. Uh, they're both very knowledgeable about craft beer and about how to run a business. And they wanted me to be the brewer. So I signed up and we planned and did a ton of work and we were set to open and then the pandemic hit and then we pushed back a little bit, but then we still opened uh, back in May and it's been a blast. It's been, I have brewed just about every week since we opened and had a new release just about every week. And uh, out of the gate, 
I was brewing these beers that I've really dialed in over the years, home brewing. And I was just excited to get them from in front of people. And some of them are still on tap at Twin Spin. Um, and there's a lot of new experimental brews I've done as well. So with that being said, let's jump in. Uh, I'm going to start with the Apple Maple Pylon. So if anyone's playing along at home, I'll give you a, a minute here to to open it and pour it out. Um, we don't have Twin Span branded glassware yet, so I'm going to be using my um, the brewery tulip, awesome brewery out of uh, California. And I opened this a few minutes ago. Um, the head on this beer does dissipate fairly quickly, as you would expect with a fruited beer. A lot of uh, a lot of fruited beers, it can be a challenge to keep a nice big frothy head on it. Um, it is still carbonated. Uh, it's uh, so we had finished correctly and everything, uh, but it does kind of resemble juice, I think. And uh, that's probably because there's a significant amount of apple juice in this exact beer. And you can get that on the nose. Um, and then you get a little maple. I get the maple really at the end. Um, so I smell apple, I taste it, and then there's this maple that comes in at the finish. Oh, cheers, by the way. Um, so, Apple Maple Pylon is kind of a clunky name. You'll find out if you haven't already learned that I'm not very good at names. Um, it's very much what it is. So, there's Apple, there's Maple, and it's of our Pylon series. So, Pylon is, uh, the name is just a, a pun on Pi. Uh, it also kind of plays into the pylons on a bridge or the sports center behind us. Um, the pylons, the little cones you can have out on the field. So, um, and if and that name wasn't taken, so kind of neat. Uh, I grabbed that one up and I grabbed that and I've been running with it. Uh, first pylon beer we had at Twin Span was the Cherry Pylon, and then we had Apple Pylon, and then we've had a few since then with that are all very similar. Um, we had. Mary Cranberry was actually a pylon beer. Um, and then there was a pumpkin pylon, of course. And now we have apple maple pylon. Uh, they're really all the same beer, actually, in terms of grain and um, water and hops and everything. Uh, it is this beer that I dialed in, one of those styles that I dialed in over many iterations, uh, to kind of give you a pie flavor. So what that means for me, um, I don't want to brew a, a pie beer and throw in like an actual slice of pie or a whole pie. I know some people do that, more power to you. Uh, I want a beer that makes you think, that evokes pie and the flavors that you get in a pie. So in this case, uh, apple maple. So it was around uh, Thanksgiving. I was on one of the food blogs that I, I follow. They were talking about alternative uh, pies for the holidays, something other than just uh, pumpkin pie. So one of the flavors was apple maple. And the picture and the description just sounded delicious. And I haven't actually made that pie or tasted that pie. But I thought, you know, that flavor makes sense. And I'd already done apple pie line. I'm like, let's, let's add maple syrup to it and see what direction that takes. And I think it works really well here. Um, Apple by itself can get really kind of acidic and tart. The maple kind of brings that back down, and the maple leans into the um, toasty malt element. So a lot of the color here isn't from the syrup. It isn't from the apple juice. It's from the base beer underneath it. And that beer has all these toasted malts and Pilsner malts and really these bready, toasty flavors. Um, I use a yeast that... Uh, is an English yeast that gives a little bit of fruit, but also uh, it gives a little butter, which normally you don't want to taste butter in your beer. But with a, a pie beer, uh, I encourage that. Uh, I, I brew it so that some of that diacetyl sticks around, and a diacetyl being the, the butter flavoring, and helps contribute, I think, to the complexity of, of the style.
see that maple's right there at the end. I don't get it at all until until I swallowed it, and then it's just maple. So I like this one. Uh, we only did a small amount of this beer. Um, I actually brewed a really big batch of the pylon, what I call the pylon base. And from that, uh, I pulled off enough to make some pumpkin pylon. That's with my homemade pie syrup, uh, pumpkin spice syrup. And then I did uh, apple maple. I did the cranberry. Uh, we have more pylons coming out soon after this one's gone. I think I'm going to bring out, it's either going to be cherry pylons coming back or we're going to get a new one, which is bourbon praline. Um, there's some other fruited pylons coming out in the future as well. So stay tuned on that. I don't expect to have two pylons on at once ever. So I let uh, the given variant run its course and we run out of that beer and then we move on to the next pylon. And the ones that people really like and respond to, they'll, they'll come back. I mean, cherry pylons coming back. Pumpkin pylon will definitely come back next year uh, when it's seasonally appropriate. Um, and I don't plan on tweaking the base beer. Uh, we actually kegged off some of just the base beer without any flavorings. That I don't know when I'm going to release that. It's really tasty. It's got this uh, English ESB almost kind of winter warmer type amber beer uh, it's really cozy um yeah that'll be something to look forward to I'm, I'm curious to see uh how people like that one so no questions come in yet um if anyone catches this when it's not live and has uh, any questions um Feel free to ping me. Um, feel free to, uh, we have a chat feature through our Facebook page. Um, you can message us through the Facebook page. Uh, there's a few of us who, are, who watch those questions as they come in. Awesome, yeah. Uh, I see some comments coming in. Yeah, I love ESB beers too. There is going to be a, uh, an, like I, I've been sitting on it for a while. I'm almost, I'm, waiting for it to be the perfect situation to come out with just this solid ESB. Um, Fuller's ESB was one of the first craft beers that I was just blown away by. And I found out later, actually, the example I had was really old and had been kind of mistreated a little bit, but I still loved it. And later when I found it relatively fresh, uh, it was a different beer, but it was still good. And that also for me made me kind of think of, uh, it leaned into the, uh, led into this beer where you know what happens you can turn some of these off flavors off flavors into working for you and that's a dangerous game to play but um i think it works here and it worked with that fuller's esb oh i'm so jealous gareth i haven't been to england yet um i was going to go this year actually and then of course plans had to change um, so as soon as it makes sense to travel again, my wife and I are going to go England, Scotland, um, check out all the sites and drinks and everything that we can there. Um, yeah. Um, a beer name wasn't taken yet. That's a good question. So uh, there are something like 7,000 breweries in the U.S., uh, right now, and they're all coming out with a ton of new beers. Um, it's very challenging to find a name that hasn't been taken already. Uh, uh, what I use is I'll Google for it. I'll go to Untapped and look for any variations on that name, um, and then um, hope that someone doesn't. If I do stumble onto an accidentally use a name someone's already using, hopefully they don't take any legal course on that discourse on that um there's a couple that are generic and i can get away with like the gold which is one of our our best sellers and one of my favorites um that is so generic i don't expect any issues with the naming of that but a beer like um pylon yeah i don't i, I don't want to step on anyone's toes with that 
And so uh, not a big deal right now since we're selling all our beer over the counter. If we got into distribution, we certainly would need to make sure everything's, the name is totally unique and legally bulletproof. Um, yeah, bourbon pecans coming soon, Creighton. Uh, you'll probably be one of the first to taste that, I'm guessing. So I'm curious what people think of that one. That one's different. That one's, I don't mean different as in, like, I'm not sure of it, but different as in uh, I don't add nut flavors to beer very often. And so that's an interesting um, way, direction to take things. Um, Eric noticed a change in Liffy. Ah, I was hoping you wouldn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to do the next batch with the original hop type? So, yeah, good question. Um, I I do brew. So that first batch of beers that we did, um, right when we opened, um, we couldn't source everything I wanted to initially. So I, I made a lot of minor changes that people seem that resulted in good beers. Um, but they weren't what I originally set out to do. So I'm trying to make these little tweaks to push it towards what I originally envisioned. And if the response to that is negative, I'll pull back and I'll go to uh, how it originally was. Um, I'm never going to change more than one thing at a time. I don't try to change it in a way that's drastically noticeable. So good on you, Eric, for your palate. <laughs> uh, maybe to answer your question, maybe I'll, I'll uh, go back. So um, I changed uh, Liberty hops i swapped them out with centennial which is kind of funny i mean thematically in terms of their name they're similar hops but in terms of flavor and aroma no they're they're a little different centennial is a lot brighter uh, a little citrusy liberty is very much like the uh, german hop strains so it's a little spicier um and i use liberty quite a bit actually in the brew house Thank you. Glad you still like it. Um, Liberty is my Red Red Redemption used Centennial and Liberty, and I released it right before Fourth of July. And I don't think anyone noticed the uh, what I was doing there, but it made I got a kick out of it. And and that's a case where I knew those hops would work well together, but I thought I'd have fun and release it with a, a beer uh, around Independence Day. So yeah, what are your thoughts on apple maple if you've tried it? Um, like I said, we have a very small amount of this in the brew house. Uh, and once it's gone, if it's coming back, it's going to be a little while. Um, I don't normally get maple syrup flavors in beers this light in color. I um, usually find maple in stouts and stuff. I see why. It's, it's, it's heavy, but... I think it really works here. I think without the apple, it wouldn't work. I, I don't think I could do a maple syrup pylon. I think it has to be apple maple. Um, but yeah, I like it. I actually haven't uh, haven't sat down with this beer yet with for a full pint. Uh, it just came out. Um, and with everything going on, um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. I'm curious to see what this is going to taste like because I have a full can here. I'm not going to probably drink the full can. I know my wife wants to try this beer as well, so I'll have to save her some. But um, I'm curious to see how that changes as it warms up. Okay, so I'm going to move on, get ready to move on to the next beer. Unless people want to stick around on apple and maple. So I'm rinsing out. Um, through the sommelier programs and the Cicerone programs, there's a big focus on keeping your palate tuned in and fresh. And so I've got water here. Um, I probably should have picked up a couple glasses because I'm going to still smell that uh, maple syrup in subsequent beers. Um, but yeah, you want to keep your palate fresh. One thing you can do, and this is going to sound really silly, but it totally works, is between tasting things, Sniff your elbow, which, like I said, it sounds crazy. Um, preferably do it for the first time uh, by yourself and not, like, at the bar. <laughs> but 
your your nose is so used to the sense of your own body throughout the day that um, and it drifts. So if you drink a lot of IPAs or you drink a, taste a lot of anything, your taste drifts, and then the next thing you have is going to pull it in a different direction. So water, unsalted crackers, and reset with uh, smelling yourself. So um, silly, but it works. And um, you'll probably see me do that a couple times on these. And just uh, tasting advice in general. Uh, if you eat something really flavorful or spicy or you just brushed your teeth for whatever reason, um, you're not going to get it's going to be even harder to reset that palate. And after like three IPAs, you're not going to eat no, no amount of water or elbow sniffing is going to reset your palate. Um, I just did with a buddy of mine, Glenn Cole, who did a IPA gauntlet on a, his podcast, What's Happening. And he brought in like 16, maybe 20, I don't know, a lot of, a lot of IPAs. And he expected like a very thoughtful <laughs> response to every IPA. And I felt so bad for the brewers IPAs after like number six, because I just, I couldn't taste anything at that point. IPAs kill your palate. That's why I'm leaving. So they, I, of the three beers we're doing tonight, uh, EDEC IPA is the final one. And I'm only doing three tonight because um, I don't like to pour out beer. And three crawlers, even between my wife and I, I think we're going to pour out some beer, unfortunately, tonight. So I'm moving on to Cool Phone Bro. This name I actually like. It's dumb, but I like it because I told it to people, this cool phone bro, and they're like, oh, okay. And I'm like, well, do you get the joke? And no. But um, I tell them it's a blackberry sour. And then people of a certain age will get that joke. And some people um, are young enough to not immediately think phone when they hear the word blackberry. <laughs> That's all it means. And I don't know if it's sarcastic or not, because I actually really liked the blackberry phone at its peak, the little keyboard and everything. Um, I had it. I was probably one of the last people, I don't know, probably one of the last people in the world to still hang on to a Blackberry, and then I had it pried out of my hands because I had to upgrade. Um, so this, if you don't see it in front of you, um, the camera's not doing a good job with it. It is pink. Uh, this is a very pink beer. It looks a bit like pink lemonade, I think. Um, and I'm, I was so excited when that came out of the fermenter, that color, because, um, that's not a natural beer color, but it is all natural ingredients. Uh, there was no food coloring. There's nothing like that. It was this base sour beer that I made and then a boatload of blackberries, <laughs> blackberry puree, actually. Um, so this is kettle sour. So Kettle sours are, unlike wild or natural sours, um, they get their souring done in the kettle. So uh, how that's done is after you uh, run off the mash liquor from the mash bed, from the mash tun, you run it into the kettle, you bring it up to a boil to kill anything that is in there that might affect the souring. And then you drop it down to about like 100 degrees, and then you add lactobacillus. So it's a live culture. It's what you find in like yogurt and um, a lot of supplements and stuff in the health food section. Um, it's lactobacillus is uh, good for your gut biome, and it's good for sour beers. So you add it to the beer and you hold it for. In this case, I held it for about two and a half days, actually. Uh, which is the longest I have ever done with uh, lactobacillus, but I really wanted to make sure I got the souring to the level I wanted. And then I, uh, you boil it again, and then you cool it and add the yeast and everything. And then when it's done, you add whatever fruit you want. So I added blackberries, because I was in the mood for blackberries, actually, and it turned out really nice. So... 
So it could. I've heard some people say they wanted a little more sour, a little more tart. And I hear you. Um, I think the next time I do this, and I am going to do this again, uh, it will be more tart, more sour, because I'm going to switch up the uh, lactobacillus strain that I'm using. So this is a case with the recipe change because it turned out really good. And people seem to really like this beer, but um, we can go a little tartar. We can go a little more sour. And I don't think anyone's going to complain about that. So you definitely get a lot of blackberry in the nose. You get that little lemonade, sourdough type thing from the, the Pilsner malt and the, and the uh, lactobacillus. And this is one of those styles right now that kettle sours, if you don't have a kettle sour on, you're, you're, you have a hole on your portfolio then. You're, you're missing something from your lineup if you don't have a kettle sour. And I've only had uh, three on so far at Twin Span. So I've had that gap there. So one of the next big batches I'm brewing, I'm doing a big batch of the sour base. And I'm going to pull off different amounts to do different fruits. So we're going to start playing around with some some fun fruits and add them to um, kettle sours. Hopefully some new fruits that other people aren't haven't tried yet in beer. Um, our chef Juan, um, I've been talking to him about it. And he's got some fruits that he told me that he can source that I've never heard of. So, yeah, let's try adding it to a beer. Let's see how it tastes. Um, this is a fizzy beer. Like, if you look at it, and it's light enough, you can really see it compared to the last one. There's a lot of little bubbles in there. Um, yeah, this is the real light, easy drinking, tart, sour beer. And I don't drink a lot of sours, to be honest, but I, res I respect a really well-made sour. And I get why they're popular. Um, they're popular because a lot of things that we drink, non-alcohol related or other fields of alcohol, are tart and they're sour and they're fruity. So why not beer? And beer is flexible enough that you can bring all these different flavors to the table and sour fruit beers is one of them. So... I guess I'm curious if here's a chance anyone who's listening if you if there's a specific sour beer flavor you want um, let me know message me or drop it in the comments and yeah why not um, go ahead and try it we have this uh, I assume you've all been in the restaurant in the dining room we have this chalkboard on one wall and it's for people to leave beer suggestions and I read those, and I brewed a couple of them, actually. Um, some of them, I don't know. <laughs> there was a bacon beer on the wall for a while, and I took it down. And I was at, I first saw it, and I was like, no way. There's no way I'm going to do a bacon beer. And then I thought about it. I'm like, man, if I could pull it off, though, maybe. I'm still thinking about that one. But uh, it would be a small batch, for sure. Uh, and then I saw pizza beer on there today which i've actually had a pizza beer before i've had a beer i don't remember the brewery i think it's california or colorado and they added all the spices and they added this uh bread crusty kind of character to it and it wasn't bad but it also wasn't one i wanted pints of i was like oh good for you guys for pulling that off um <laughs> I, I need to scroll i was missing somebody's comments yeah so um Uh, the gold being a bit more biscuit and bready on the first fast. That's interesting. I didn't actually change anything on the gold. Um, I, I, well, that's not true. I, I, we sourced uh, it from a different yeast supplier. Same strain of yeast. Um, a lot of these yeast suppliers will have the same yeast, but they'll call it something different. Um, batch 2 was a different supplier. And actually, I'm brewing the gold again here real soon. I'm going back to... Um, the first supplier. So I'm real curious if, uh, Matt, if you, once I do that, if you're going to pick up that biscuit and bready just as much. Um, I, the gold is personal favorite of mine, especially when it's warm out. 
I don't know. I know I don't have that one in front of me today, but um, super low ABV. I mean, 3.9. Um, and it's it was a beer that came about because I've been playing with all of these fun ingredients like Golden Promise, Golden Naked Oats, um, Eldorado Hops. And then I was like, oh, what are those all in the common? And I, I was calling that beer City of Gold for the longest time because of that. And I really just dialed that one in probably more than almost any other beer to, I would tweak one variable every time and then until I got to that. And you drink that beer cold, it's like a good crushable beer, good on the patio. But if you let it warm up just a little bit, it is a British beer, so it wants to warm up a little bit to like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that Eldorado just pops out and those small characters and honey just, they just pop out. So. Um, yeah, but it's also a beer that it's very gentle, and yeah, I can totally see how it's going to change over time and changes from batch to batch. Blackberry Pylon, yeah, yeah, I actually haven't thought of that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll write that one down. Um, I wouldn't have it on the same time as, as, uh, as uh, Cool Phone Bro. Um, because that, yeah, I, I try to keep things balanced up there on the selections, but, um, that would be fun. That'd be fun. I thought of, like, blueberry pylon, and I don't have that ready to go or anything right now, but there's some other fruit, fruit pies for sure. Cool Foam Bro is actually really similar to the first Kettle Sour at Twin Span, which is Moliner Vice. Which is a Berliner Weiss. Um, it's not technically a Berliner Weiss because um, I don't use wheat in it. I use oats, and I think that helps make it a little lighter and gives it a little chewier mouthfeel than than wheat does. Um, tweaked it a little bit in this one and added lactose. I didn't add lactose in Berliner Weiss, but adds a little sweetness. Oh, I really want to do cask conditioned beer. I'm actually, for the next level of the Cicerone program I'm studying for, um, they have required reading, and one of them is the cask manual, the camera approved cask manual. Um, that'd be real fun to get a pen or a firkin and a hand pump to uh, grip the bar and just do a really short draw thing sometime. I could see doing that with the gold. Um, and actually last weekend I brewed and, uh, and it's on the board, uh, but it's not ready to drink yet, uh, an 1893 IPA. So I'll be real excited to talk about that one when it gets closed here, but, um, that beer would be really good for, um, a cask and that's a recipe from 1893. So, uh, they weren't doing stainless steel carbonated kegs then. I'll tell you all the sour I need tonight. Um, I actually did a wild sour already once. That was the Tia Spachi. Uh, and then that, that was a different type of souring. That wasn't kettle souring. Um, that was the wild yeast from the pineapple rinds. Um, but it was small enough that I added it to the Kolsch um, solo silo. And it didn't turn that beer sour, so I didn't advertise it as a sour. But, yeah, I've done a couple so far. So anybody drinking along, playing along at home? Or if you're drinking another beer, what you tell me what you're drinking. I mean, Saturday night, I think it's a requirement. I just went to, um, yeah, I should shout out. Um, I went to, um, I was out of an ingredient in the brew house and I needed it to brew. Um, I'm brewing tomorrow and it, the, what I ordered wasn't going to arrive till next week. Um, the guys at Wake helped out. So I stopped over there yesterday. They, it was kind of the, 
visit your neighbor for a cup of sugar thing. And uh, they also hooked me up with beer, which was really nice, really awesome. So not only are they helping me out, but they're giving me beer. And uh, I had their uh, resin, which is a 13% um, alcohol um, imperial stout with fruit, with blackberries. Um, blackberries and something else. It's really good. Uh, I'm, I'm a little scared of 13% alcohol stout so anymore. So many of them are so sweet and so filling. And uh, I guess I shouldn't have been worried knowing uh, the Paris Brothers, but um, it was just a really nice, solid, not filling, but still delicious beer. And it's 13% alcohol, and, which is, will knock you on your butt. Um, oh, wow. Fancy Bourbon County um, Caramella. I haven't had that one yet. I actually haven't had any of the variants this year. Um, but that one sounds good. I did actually just last week. Um, I do have a couple of bourbon counties I lay down, just the regular in my cellar. Um, actually right on the other side of this wall here. And uh, yeah, I can't, I'm not gonna do a vertical by myself. <laughs> That beer is 15% alcohol, but it's good. It's good after a year. It's good after two years. It's good and fresh. Um, and I know Goose Island's doing some some good stuff with that. Dogfish Head 120. Yes, 20%. <laughs> yeah, I remember the first time I tried that, I had I had no idea the alcohol percentage on it. Uh, this was quite a while ago. 10, 11 years ago, and um, I was watching a movie, sitting on the couch, drinking it, and I felt fine, and then I got up, and I just about fell over, just, woo. yeah, sneaky. Okay, moving on to 80 East, so 80 East regarding names is multiple beers. It's an 80 series. Um, 80 East referring to the fact that it's an East Coast IPA, a New England IPA. So um, there it is. Cheers. Excuse me. Um, East Coast IPA, uh, I'm sure you all know but it's um, hazy, it's soft, it's chewy, it's very hot forward um, compared to West Coast, which used to be the king, and West Coast being very crisp, clear, um, still hot forward, much more bitter, darker in color. Um, I prefer, personally, I was one of the people who really rallied, fought against the haze craze and initially thought these hazy brewers are just lazy brewers, which is the opposite of the truth, because doing a really good hazy IPA is very challenging. Um, I also thought it was they were just too one note. Um, it wasn't that long ago that a lot of craft brewers were doing a race to the top on the most bitter beer they can make. Um, Dogfish had used to advertise uh, the 90-minute IPAs, 120-minute, differently. They they would really hammer on how many IBUs are in those beers, which they're significant. Um, and now they don't anymore. And I think the discussion has changed away from how bitter can we make this beer and how big can we make it to you know, how much flavor, how bold a flavor we can get. And you need a ton of hops for that. But if you go too many hops or use the hops wrong, the beer just becomes awful. So, yeah, it's a challenge. Um, and I also know, because I'm guilty of this myself, I go, I frequent places like Central Store and get all the awesome hazies that they have. 
I rarely order buy the same hazy twice because um, I think the hazy IPAs are very they're catering to those people who are looking for the next new flavor and next big thing. Um, so I don't feel like I should be doing the same hazy IPA multiple times, but they're very similar. So uh, that is a case where I the first two times I did it, it was the exact same base beer, different hops. So 80 East to Ariana was the first one. It was Citra Mosaic Ariana, which I thought was neat. Uh, I used that hop years ago and, and I kind of forgot about it. And then um, brought it back in for one of our first beers, which was uh, nothing on my bark. And I just love that hop. So that was the first one to come in. And then the second one was El Dorado, another hop I love. But I felt things were getting too grapefruity, too citrusy, too kind of pithy uh, with that. So this one, I kicked out um, Mosaic. So this one is Citra, um, El Dorado, and Amarillo. So we're kind of rotating the hops. And then in this case, I actually I changed so many things between 80 East um, to El Dorado and 80 East to Amarillo. Uh, but I kept the color essentially the same. Um, I did changes in when I added hops to the kettle, to the Whirlpool. I added, I increased. So every iteration I've added more and more hops. We're up to like two and a half pounds per barrel, which is still not nearly as high as some of these brewers out there. Uh, but still a ton of hops. And um, I put in some unmalted wheat this time to really help bring up that body. Um, there was a Chicago area brewer and I can't remember who it was. I should. Um, they had just amazing mouthfeel and body for an IPA. And that's what I'm aiming for. Uh, I want this soft, pillowy, chewy, but still loaded with hops, uh, hazy. And I feel every iteration, I'm getting a little closer to that. And along the way, I'm, I'm playing with which hops get, uh, get used. So um, I don't know what's after Haiti East to Amarillo. Um, I'm kind of, I've got an IPA I'm brewing here soon with Nelson and um, Haller Calblon. One of those might make it into the next Haiti East. Those are really, those are awesome hops. Uh, I, or I might just try some totally out there hop. Uh, there's some new South uh, African hops that are, really interesting and it'll be kind of fun to call it beer 80s to south africa or something <laughs> uh, 80 west will come out i promise i'm disappointed in myself that i haven't released 80 west yet but i have a really solid recipe um i feel like if i wait too long it's not gonna it's not gonna fit in at all um, i've noticed west coast ipas are shifting and becoming more East Coasty, they're getting less bitter, they're getting juicier, they're getting a little hazier. And my 80 West is not those things, it's the old school um, 80 West or West Coast. Yeah, I get a lot of tropical. Um, I chose Amarillo because for this time, I used to use Amarillo a lot of my homebrew recipes. It's really orangey, I get. I almost get like orange juice from it. I love orange juice. Um, yeah. This IPA I'm brewing tomorrow with Nelson is probably going to end up pretty easy. Um, I'm adding, like I said, Nelson, Haller Cal Blanc. If you know those hops, those are the two hops that get described as wine like. So, and that's why I'm using them. So this IPA is going to be have um, white wine and grape juice in it as well. So I wouldn't quite call it a IPA beer wine hybrid, but it's going to be 
certainly leaning into those um, wine characteristics, wine flavors. Um, that one's going to be ready to go for our Valentine's Day dinner, actually. So I think it'll fit in thematically there. Old 80. So I, if I'm going to call your old 80, it's going to have to be like an old ale or um, I don't know, something that gets aged for a while. Like in looking up and getting ready for that 1893 IPA, I was reading all these old old as in like 130 plus years ago, IPAs had just an insane amount of IBUs, like calculated 150 IBUs, which is, should strip the enamel off your teeth. Um, but what they were doing is they're aging them then for like a year. And so those IBUs would drop off a little bit and smooth out. Um, I don't know if my partners at the brewery would be okay in that kind of experiment, but Maybe at home I should I should brew a old eighty and just do an old school IPA that ages for a year in a barrel. Um, there will be an eighty south one of these days. I don't know what that's going to be. Eighty north was actually got that name because I was going to brew eighty west right out of the gate, and the day before I brewed that beer. No, a couple of days before. That was back in March when they announced the, uh, they were calling this thing a, a pandemic and everything was shutting down. And we were talking at the brewery, we can't open right now. We need to, we need to push this out a little bit. And so here's, um, I was ready to make 15 barrels, which is like 500 gallons of a West Coast IPA. And I just didn't know when are people going to are people going to want to come in and try it? Are people going to want to buy this? How long are we going to sit on the spear? Um, so I ended up, I added some more grain. I added some sugar. Um, I reduced, it wasn't 500 gallons anymore. I lowered that down. So it was a smaller batch. Uh, all in the name of making a beer that could age and survive uh, the apocalypse. <laughs> and it kept fermenting and I was like, oh shoot, this thing's like almost 10% alcohol. And I used special yeast. I haven't used the vegan since then. I was using Ro uh, Rogue Brewery's yeast on that. They have a special strain of yeast, uh, which I love that brewery. And ended up with this thing that I called initially an Imperial IPA. And to certain people, when you say something's Imperial IPA, they want just a juicy, fruity, hazy hop bomb. I mean, that was none of those things. It's what I had made was more akin to something like Dogfish Head 90 or um, speaking of Rogue, Old Crustacean, something like that. Um, Sierra Nevada Bigfoot. So after it aged for a little bit, uh, I ended up on the board at least changing it to barley wine. Um, and it does straddle those two worlds between Imperial IPA and a barley wine. And I'm really happy with how that turned out. And it hasn't, it's aged really well. The hops haven't dropped out. Um, it's still a very hop forward beer if you try it today. So what we, I didn't know what to call it. And one of the partners suggested 80 North. And I was like, at the time I was like, oh, there is no 80 North. So why not? And yeah, part of 80 does run North South. So it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it's, it yeast warms up, brings in all these different flavors. Ah, Three Floyds, Robert the Bruce. Um, I have a story around that as well. <laughs> I love Three Floyds. Uh, I like Robert the Bruce. Good on them for making uh, a strong Scotch ale as a regular offering. Um, I love Scottish beers. Um, one of the first times I got that beer and I was sitting at home. This was a long time ago. We had a cat. My wife had just brought a cat home and uh, the kitten. And I wasn't paying attention. And the cat snuck in and started drinking my Robert the Bruce. <laughs> the cat seemed to love it. But I was like, no. Oh. I, I didn't know. Maybe there's something in beers that wouldn't hurt a cat. Um, cats shouldn't drink beer. I know that. So 
uh, <laughs> I didn't let the cat have any more, but I was like, okay. Ringing endorsement for, for your brand, Love by Cats. Um, yeah, I have a lot of really dark, strong multi beers. Um, right now, uh, Bach Island just ran out. Um, uh, Panamoon. I probably should have introduced that into the lineup tonight. Maybe the next time I do this. Uh, Barrel Age Panamoon is out now. Um, Stormbridge is pretty dark. Uh, I want to bring back Bambuco, which isn't super dark, but it was uh, English Brown um, that we opened with. And that was a style. That was one of those recipes I dialed in for many iterations as well. It's somewhere between... Um, Somewhere between Newcastle and and uh, Samuel Smith's Nut Brown Ale, uh, and I use a lot of Belgian sugar in that. Actually, um, that's a. I really love that beer. I'm just trying to find the right time to position that and bring it back on uh, tap. Personally, if no one else drinks that beer, I'll I will drink the whole batch. <laughs> So, yeah, and I was on a podcast defending that style not too long ago, uh, Basic Brewing Radio, and someone had done a previous episode saying how much they didn't like English Browns and how boring they were, and I took that personally. Flying Dog in Maryland, yeah, it's been a long time. That was one of those when I first got into craft beer, for whatever reason. They were one of the like 10 craft breweries I can source here in the Midwest. And yeah, I need to revisit them. I don't even know if I can find them though right now here in the Quad Cities. Maybe maybe one of the high V's or somebody's carrying it. I just missed it. Snake Dog. That wasn't a Belgian IPA though, was it? I don't remember which one was Snake Dog. Yeah, I have stories for a lot of my beers. Um, you hang around beer long enough and talk about beer long enough and drink enough beer, you get stories. And that's part of why a lot, a big part of why I went and focused my studies on Cicerone versus, say, like working my way up the ranks in BJCP. There's a lot of value in the BJCP program. That's the Beer Judge Certified Program. It's when you go to a homebrew competition, um, the knowledgeable judges are BJCP certified and experts. Um, I really like the side of the Cicerone program. That was about the stories and the history and the people side of things and how to best walk someone through trying beer rather than just saying the beer should be like this. It's the added understanding that beer changes over time. That's not to say BJCP judges don't know that. It's just the program is structured so that you don't have to know the history. Whereas with the Cicerone, um, I had an, an essay question that was, you know, tell me the history and the technical details and the flavor details and the food pairings for uh, American Double IPA. So I had to know um, about Vinny Chalurzo in California coming up with uh, Blind Pig and then Pliny the Elder. And I had to know about the context around when that beer first happened and why they created it and how it's changed since then uh, and how it it ultimately led into, I think, these hazies on the, the East Coast. I mean, Pliny the Elder has a ton of hops. Uh, they use them differently than they use in New England IPAs. But yeah, beer changes. Um, who knows what the next big thing will be? People have a lot of opinions and theories, but it's really what uh, the consumers' tastes are and what they're changing. Maybe, maybe something like a seltzer IPA is coming up. Um, Yeah. Dogfish at campfire amplifier. Tastes like a turtle dessert. 
Thank you for specifying dessert. Um, I haven't had that one. Dogfish had had a uh, they had a beer with the Grateful Dead reference on it, and that's one of the only beers when I cracked open, like you could smell across the room. I love that beers can have that much aroma, but holy cow, I mean, it smelled dank. I'll put it that way. It was a very dank beer. And at one point, I do, I do have beer in my recipe notebook. Uh, I called it, and I it might this name might be taken. I'll have to look it up. But I called it Dank Star, Dank Star, Lord of the Dankness. And I went out and I actively sought to brew the most pot smelling uh, beer I could possibly make without actually adding uh, any marijuana to it. And uh, it was good, but. That's fun. Ride Marzen is the next big thing. I hope so. Um, Ride Toberfest is a ride. Meritson. Um, so I promised, uh, yeah, Belgians will come back. So yeah, I promised what is coming at Twins Fan. So um, nothing is set in stone, but I'm working on creating a balanced tap rail that has a little bit for everyone. Um, this is my first time owning a brewery and uh, balancing a, a tap list. So uh, it has its challenges. Uh, what I necessarily love isn't what everyone else loves. And I am, I'm so pleased when those things overlap. But I'm also really happy when a beer I didn't think, uh, the, when a beer gets more popular than I expected. So, um, I've been looking at what was the most popular in 2020 for our beers, our first year. And I even have a program to compute that. That's the kind of nerd I am. And uh, I look at sales. I look at ounces sold per day. And I'm making some decisions around that. It's not the sale, end all, but it's driving some of my decisions. So... I've already mentioned a couple of them here. More pylon variants. I really like the idea of a blackberry pylon. Um, more, and that's the case where pylon is absolutely not going to change, but the flavors I lay on top of it will change. Um, it's rare for me to just to find a recipe and I'm like, that's it, that's perfect. The pylon base, I'm, I'm not going to change it. Um, Liffy and Liffy Light are going to stick around. Uh, maybe I'll uh, bring Liberty back on the next batch. Uh, we're figuring out what our flagships are, what our staples are, based on what consumer demand is. So the gold isn't going anywhere, which I'm so happy that was that beer has been as popular as it is. Yeah, I think I just answered your question. The gold, um, I'm surprised. The, the beer that surprised me at how well it did. Um, Moliner Vice, too. Moliner Vice, um, I made a barrel of that and it sold out in two days, which is was not expecting. But it, it told me that uh, my customers want sour beers. Um, but the gold was this beer nerdy thing. And Gareth, it's probably not super nerdy if you, since you've spent time in England. But um, I don't know who makes a British gold over here. Um, it's really hard to find a commercial British gold, as the style British gold. And um, I want to say there's that uh, Trooper British Gold. You can find bottles around here. I forget the brewery name. Um, glad you like it. Um, and it is a beer that's nuanced. So I feel, and this is me getting on my soapbox a little bit, I feel like a lot of the highest rated beers out there, the most hyped, are the ones that bludgeon you over the head with flavor like I'm this big uh, uh, IBUs I'm this high alcohol I use this much lactose I use this much fruit and at some point uh, the bottom falls out of that argument and there are beers where that doesn't happen so a really well-made Hellas nothing will change that Hell, I'm sure that style will still be around in 50 years and still be amazing 
uh, a British gold or a light bitter or something British like that. It's got the little flavors that really play well together, especially when they're warmed up. That's not going anywhere. But, and maybe I was under estimating the customers and, and thinking that they wouldn't like a nuanced beer. Um, but yeah, that one has sold really well for being such a weird little obscure style. Uh, and I'm so happy that, that people like that one because that, that's my go-to. Uh, pecan pie stout. I actually need to look at <laughs> So I did a bunch of, speaking of variants, uh, I did a bunch of Steel Beam variants. So Steel Beam is my Irish stout at Twin Span. I say my, a lot of them I'll say ours, but Steel Beam is the beer I have iterated through more than any other. That is over 10 years of me tweaking that recipe and keeping it on tap at, at my home bar. Um, and that's the other side of the coin to Gareth's question. That beer I thought would be like everyone's favorite and it hasn't been but i've been started adding variants so we had cinnamon steel beam we had cinnamon roll steel beam which was a different beer uh, right now we have horchata steel beam i don't have a pecan pie steel beam i have a s'mores coming up i have a chai tea latte steel beam um one of my partners who's crazy um he added Carolina Reaper powder to a keg of steel beam along with some chocolate. Um, Diablo chocolate steel beam will come out eventually and burn your face off. It is hot. He likes it. Red Red Redemption. Um, Red Red Redemption was strange in that a lot of these beers. Uh, when I look at my metrics for how well they sold, um, they'll spike right away, and then they'll stay at that level. Um, Red Red opened to not much fanfare, but gradually grew in popularity until it was gone. So I don't know what that means. That beer changed um, since we tapped it. Uh, I don't know the science behind that, but... Uh, it started off very aggressively hot, and then um, that malt really started to shine through. Uh, I really like that beer. I don't know if it'll come back, but something like it will come back. I have one of my, right before I, I opened Twin Span, one of the recipes I've been really tweaking was a Manhattan IPA, and it's similar. Um, it has rye, and it's red, and it uses hops that kind of make you think of a Manhattan cocktail. Uh, which I love rye whiskey and I love Manhattan cocktails. So I'm really excited about getting that one going. And, uh, I want more red IPAs. I think that's a really underserved style. Blue milk stout, no. <laughs> I don't. I, I know that's a Star Wars reference, but I, I'm also thinking of. Uh, how would one make a blue milk stout? Oh, hot ones to come by when that beer is ready, maybe. <laughs> um, so we had Red Red Damnation, which was uh, a similar case, the same partner. He took a keg of Red Red Redemption and he added Carolina Reefer powder to it. And I'm not a huge fan of spice. I can never go on hot ones because I tap out after like whatever comes above mild. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, he served, he was trying to, my partner was trying to dose the right amount of Carolina Reaper off of regular red, red. And he gave me the sample and I took a sip of it and I must've just turned red and I just walked away and just saying, nope, 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 pour it down the drain. And he's like, well, that was six times stronger than what I planned red, red damnation to be. And then I said some not so nice things to him, and it's, my mouth is on fire. Uh, so that's a rare case of I'm going to put that beer on, and I, I'll taste it. I'm probably not going to drink much of it. It's probably going to be delicious. And the people who ordered Red Red Damnation 
the people who knew that going in that it was going to be this burn your face off hot beer, they loved it. I mean, we, we, we were getting five star check ins on Untapped on that. Crazy, crazy people. Uh, I respect you, but you're crazy. Mm, I guess sideline. So, what else is coming out? Um, more Belgians, yeah. Kurt, so um, I have my City Beer series, so I did Davin Porter, which is coming back real soon. Davin Porter, uh, that's another one I changed. I had to change Davin Porter because the first batch was small scale, and I could only get certain ingredients at that scale. Big scale opens up some more doors, and so I made 17 barrels of Davin Porter, and it is awesome. It's sitting in the tank right now. It just needs to get kegged and needs to find an open tap. Um, and that beer is... So, behind me, I have an 1888 map of Davenport. And it was back there when I was writing that recipe. So, molasses, corn, six row, um, hops that kind of taste like tobacco. Um, that is... that is. That is a love letter to Davenport history, and I'm that one's coming back. It's coming back in a big way. Um, and then, um, yeah, the Belgians. So, uh, oh no, the city beers. So then I did Moliner Vice, thanks to Kurt for the name. Um, and then I did Bach Island. Uh, the name for that one came from one of our bartenders, Michelle. Um, and that beer has done really well. And a great name, one that hadn't been taken. Um, there is going to be a Bentendorf beer. I'm thinking around our one-year anniversary in May. Um, the other cities get challenging. Leclerc, there will be a Leclerc beer. And I kind of have an idea what I'm going to do for that. Um, and then Silvis, I have no idea. I'll do a Silvis beer. I mean, they're all punny names. There's no beer style that sounds like Silvis. Um, yeah, uh, no Eldridge beers. Uh, but this is a Belgian beer. So uh, there is a style of beer called a quad. So the Belgians do their single or their um, Abbey ales. And then they do doubles, triples, and quads or Belgian dark strong. And I, in my notes, the Belgian Dark Strong is BDSM. <laughs> Belgian Dark Strong, man. Uh, I don't want to name a beer that, though. I mean, I do, but um, I named it the Quad City Quad instead because you can't pass that pun by. And so I have this 10.7% alcohol, a big batch of it, Quad. Uh, you've, if you've tried T.S. Ponce, you've had it, but you've had it diluted with... The alcohol's been diluted because we added the, the punch to it. Uh, but it's underneath that. And it is a big honking beer that knocks me on my butt every time I taste it, every time I drink it. So I'm happy to share that experience with all of you soon. Um, and then looking ahead, um, I'm getting ready for our Valentine's Day dinner. So... That's our next beer and food pairing. It's going to be on Valentine's Day. Tickets are available now online. I uh, highly encourage you to, to pick them up now because we're limited on how many we can sell. And I've seen the menu. I can't tell you what the menu is yet. But Juan has made an awesome menu that I have to host this thing. Because I'm at these beer dinners. Uh, Juan and I get out and we talk to people and we talk about the beer and the food. Uh, this is a case where I really wish I wasn't hosting because I want to actually sit down and eat all the food he has planned. Um, but I'm bringing, I'm brewing my oyster stout. So I'm going to brew a big high alcohol beer with a lot, with oysters in it. Uh, I'm brewing that maybe next week. Um, I'm excited about that. I've done that before. And oysters add this brininess and this salinity to a stout that you just, you can't replicate without adding real oysters to it. And oysters, uh, there's a reason it's going to be on Valentine's Day. Oysters have uh, certain qualities, they say. Uh, so that'll be there. 
Uh, people liked our Midwest legend, which was a Saison. I took Glenn's recipe for the beer fundraiser for the derecho victims, and I kind of made it into a Saison, but it wasn't built from the ground up as a Saison. Um, so I want to do a Saison again. And I love the fact that I can get Iowa grown barley and hops. So I want to do, because Saison is a harvest farmer's beer. Um, I want that to be an all Iowa beer that comes back in a big way. Um, what else? I want to bring back my Maybach. Nothing on Maybach. Uh, 1040. People love 1040. That my uh, I call it a Keller Pills, but it probably should have been more of like a fest uh, fest beer because it was big, high ABV. Um, but it's just a big, bold. Um, German lager, and that'll come back. And I've already said Bambuco. Um, I want to do a wit. I've had a, if you've been reading the website, I apologize. I've said a coming soon of a wit for a long time. Um, I do actually have plans to brew a wit. Um, that's all I have written down right now. Oh, it's some barrel age stuff. So that's exciting. Um, barrel age Pan of Moon is out. But then I got some really interesting barrels um, of barrel in particular. You can see if you look through the window over in the corner of the dining room, I've got this massive barrel um, that has seen some stuff, man. I mean, it has had um, some very respectable bourbons and beers residing inside of it. Um, when will we see peated grains? So, yeah, like I mentioned, I love scotch ales and I love, um, uh, and I'm adding briny flavors to a stout, um, adding peat flavors to a beer is a really big challenge. Uh, people used to always add them to their scotch ales because scotch uses peat, but to be actually uh, authentic, Scotch ale, they never use peat malt. So you just find fun places to sneak peat in. Um, I did an Adam beer once, which I'm going to have to brew again for obvious reasons, uh, the homebrew level. Um, and Kurt in the chat, he's done an excellent Adam beer. Um, you can use quite a bit of peat in that. Uh, so an Adam beer is a big, dark, sometimes sour German beer uh, with a significant amount of peat malt. And it's bizarre. It's, it's all these things coming together. Um, it's good. Uh, I don't know where else to add peat in a beer that doesn't. I did a, at home. I did a braggot with peat malt once, and a little bit goes a very long ways. Um, yeah, I'll do a Maybach. I need to get the Maybach going again. Yeah, so I used to brew not to style at all. I mean, I just kind of did my own thing. There's a and I rally and I was pushing against the fact that styles were a thing. Uh, I've since learned that there's a very good reason we have these beer styles, and it's not. You have to you have to really learn what the rules are in order to break them. It's one way to put it. And you spend enough time learning the rules, it's hard to learn how to break them. So, yeah, I mean, there's beers like Liffy. Liffy isn't really a pre-prohibition lager. It is, but I'm using ingredients that aren't in the style guidelines. Um, so, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll see something. Barrel-aged wheat wine. Um, yeah, I think you could help me with that, Kurt. All right, uh, any questions, beer suggestions, anything you want to talk about before um, I wrap up? This has been fun. I'll have to do it again. I can't actually see how many people are watching. This is the first time I've done Facebook Live. Um, and this will post afterwards um, for people who weren't able to watch it live. 
I think. Uh, and I want to go back over some of the beers that we've already released and then talk about some new ones. Maybe I'll do another one of these once Davenport releases again. Um, it, it goes really arm in arm with Liffy, so that could be a fun combination. Uh, certainly, we'll talk when the 1893 IPA comes out. That one's got a fun story. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for joining me. Um, this was fun. Uh, keep checking the website and Facebook. Um, I'm, I'm the one updating the, the website, so, um, and I keep a little timestamp at the top. So if you're ever not sure, um, if you're not sure my little what's coming next thing is accurate, uh, that timestamp should, should tell you how accurate it is. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone who's come out so far and, and enjoyed our beer and those who joined virtually here today. I'm really happy that uh, I get to share these beers and these recipes and these stories with you guys. So cheers until next time.